<laughs> Very good, welcome. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Blessed Lord, who hast caused all Holy Scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> now, last time, I know it seems a long time ago, but it's three weeks ago, uh, we had that wonderful passage, chapter 6 of 2 Samuel, where David brings the ark up to Jerusalem. And uh, we saw how that was very closely related by St. Luke to the visitation. And remembering that the sacred author doesn't really worry too much about chronology or, or, you know, you can leap ahead and leap back again. Um, uh, we now come to the, the logical next stage of the story, although how much later it is, we're not told. And it happened when the king was dwelling in his house and the Lord granted him respite all around from his enemies that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See, pray, I dwell in a cedarwood house, while the ark of God dwells within curtains. Today is the feast of the presentation of Our Lady in the temple. Uh, so there's a nice um, uh, tying in here of the idea of uh, a temple being constructed. And it um, begins, and it happened, and, and then another time, while the king was dwelling in his house. So we've only just heard about Michal despising David for dancing and cavorting before the ark. And he says that's why the Lord took the throne from the house of Saul and gave it to me. And so this is emphasised by, there's the king in his capital city, which he himself has conquered, and he's there enjoying his house. And the Lord granted him respite all around from his enemies. This made me think of um, what we sing in the Christmas martyrology, uh, the whole world being at peace. I'm not sure it was particularly peaceful, but except for a few moments, but the idea of the Pax Romana when our Lord was born. And here, and it's only a brief respite because there'll be more enemies later on, and in the next chapter, in fact, but there's this sense of David sits down in his house and he says, what next? And then we meet this character, Nathan, um, we've not heard of him before, he gets no introduction, uh, he's just, he's Nathan the prophet, and I suppose the first readers or hearers just knew who Nathan the prophet was, and so uh, why tell us about him? He's the, the court prophet, it will be he later on who uh, points the finger and says, thou art the man, and of course, um, most famously, uh, we know that Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon king. So he's going to carry on into the next reign. So David calls um, Nathan to him and says, look, here I am living in this lovely house, a cedar wood house. Presumably it's a stone built house panelled with cedar wood. And, and that's a real status symbol. I don't know if you have any of you have cedar wood houses. <laughs> Perhaps not. Um, uh, but um, a bit like actually uh, in um, uh, you know, Tudor England, even um, having a panelled house was, was a great status symbol. Um, and my, meanwhile, the Ark of God dwells within curtains, the nice little expression meaning you know, the Ark of God's in a tent, and here am I in a house. And Nathan said to the king, Whatever is in your heart, go, do, for the Lord is with you. So Nathan doesn't even have to think about it. Obviously, yes, build a temple, that's fantastic, and we know the Lord is with you, he's going to love this. Will he, though? 
And it happened on that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go, say to my servant, to David, Thus says the Lord, Is it you who will build me a house for me to dwell in? For I have dwelt in no house from the day I brought up the Israelites out of Egypt until this day, but I have gone about in tent and tabernacle. Wherever I went about among the, all the Israelites, did I speak a word with any of the tribal chiefs of Israel, whom I charged to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why did you not build me a cedar wood house? And now, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I myself took you from the pasture, from following the flocks, to be prince over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut down your enemies before you. And I will make you a great name, like the name of the great of the earth. And I will set aside a place for my people, for Israel, and plant them. And they shall abide there and no longer quake. And the wicked shall no more afflict them as before, from the day that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will grant you respite from all your enemies. And the Lord declares that it is he who will make you a house. When your days are full and you lie with your fathers, I will raise up your seed after you, who will issue from your loins, and I will make his kingship unshaken. He it is who will build a house for my name, and I will make the throne of his kingship unshaken for ever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. So should he do wrong, I will chastise him with the rod men use and with the afflictions of humankind. But my loyalty shall not swerve from him, as I made it swerve from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingship shall be steadfast for ever, your throne unshaken for ever. In accordance with all these words, and in accordance with all this vision, so did, David, so did Nathan speak to David. And it was best to read the whole of that passage because you get the sense, the sweep of it. It's a very majestic passage. If we go back um, to the beginning of it, uh, we see firstly, what is the reason why David is not the man to build the temple? Well, firstly, God hasn't asked for it. Um, you know, it's like the unholy fire that previously was brought into the tabernacle. Um, the tabernacle was made absolutely in accordance with God's instructions. He was the one who commanded them to do it. And he hasn't commanded David to build him a temple. Uh, there's no reason given here why David's not the man to do it. But we do discover the reason in the books of Chronicles. Chronicles um, are the sort of cleaned up version of the books of Samuel and Kings. Um, you know, they leave out all of the juicy bits. Um, but they do sometimes provide a, a little gloss that, that helps us. And there, David tells the people of Israel, and he tells Solomon, um, I'm not the man to do this because I have shed much blood. Um, so therefore, he's, he's not the man to, to build the temple. Um, and we get a rehearsal of all of God's care for Israel. Um, did I ever say I wanted to dwell in a house? And there's also the sense, I think, an underlying criticism of the idea that you can contain God. Uh, the Lord is somehow present in the tabernacle, but he travels about and, and it's a very mysterious presence. Um, he's not like the other gods who are in their temple like Dagon. And although he will later command the temple to be built. Even that, I would suggest there is an underlying unease about it. It's a bit like um, when the tribes come and say, we want a king, and Samuel is furious, and the Lord is furious, but they end up giving them a king anyway. 
And it's almost as though this is the same again. David says, we want a temple. And the Lord says, why? Did I say I wanted a temple? Um, but one gets built anyway. And it gets built really with slave labour. I mean, the whole country gets turned into Solomon's fiefdom. And it's the culmination of the power of the monarchy and the power um, that Solomon exerts to build his own palace and then his own um, grandeur and also this temple. Uh, and the temple is only ever provisional. Uh, if you go to the Temple Mount today, and if you get the chance to do so, I advise you to do so. And you see this vast space, and of course it now has the Dome of the Rock, and there's a mosque there, but there's a vast empty space, and you can you just have to use your imagination to think of um, all the Israelites coming to offer their sacrifices and, and the pilgrimages coming and the different courts that there would have been. I sat in a quiet corner and said the fourth and fifth decades of the Joyful Mysteries of the Rosary, um, the presentation of Jesus in the temple and the child Jesus found in the temple. And we also think of how Our Lady grew up there, uh, that uh, she was perhaps as young as three years old and presented in the temple and, and lived there as a sign of her total dedication to God, her total giving of herself. And in that sense, just as we understood Our Lady as the Ark of the Covenant, we understand her as being the temple, the place where God dwells, the place that makes <coughs> him present. And because these analogies are sometimes transferable, we can also say that, that Christ himself is the temple. He is the presence of God upon earth, which is why the temple can be destroyed in the year AD 70, and, and it causes a crisis both in Judaism and in Christianity. For the Jews, it meant the triumph of the Pharisees and the emergence of what we now call rabbinical Judaism, that God became portable. He's, he's in the Torah. He's present when they, when they listen to his word. And for Christians came the understanding that we don't need to offer blood sacrifices anymore because there is one sacrifice offered once for all on, on Calvary, which is renewed in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And the temple only points towards these things. And that, I think, is what, through Nathan, the Lord is telling David, He's saying, it's not for you to build me a house, I will build you a house. And all of the difficulties that we have with David's battles and with all the bloodshed and, and, and the violence are swept away when we realise he's just the sign. And his victories and his little empire, and it's, it's only a little empire really, um, are emblems of the eternal empire of Christ the King, his descendant. And when the Lord says, I will build you a house, well, actually Solomon does build the Lord a house, but that's provisional. And he's not really talking principally about Solomon. He's talking about the one who will come a thousand years later, and Mary will be the house. And she is a descendant of King David, and from her will issue a descendant of King David, and that's secured by Joseph's lineage. And if we go through, we can um, see some of the, the phrases which we'll find echo echoed again. He will build you a house. I will raise up your seed after you. I will make his kingship unshaken. I will make the throne of his kingship unshaken forever. I will be a father to him and he a son to me. And your house and your kingship shall be steadfast forever. And that's a problem if we look at it historically because the last Davidic king, I mean, the, David's line lasted you know, over four centuries, an extraordinary length of time. Not many dynasties in history do, but it did come to an end, um, and eventually if we live long enough we'll hear about it, um, when King Zedekiah um, saw all of his 
son was murdered in front of him and then had his eyes put out so that this was the last thing that he saw. And yet God raises up a shoot from the stump of Jesse. I want to read to you, partly because one can never read this passage too often, but also because we'll see all of the echoes that there are from the seventh chapter of the second book of Samuel in the second chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke. Last week we heard the visitation. We go back a bit. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I have no husband? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I read something today that struck me. The writer said, when the angel comes to Mary, he is amazed and overwhelmed by the beauty of her holiness. So although Mary is troubled in the presence of an angel, it's the angel who bursts out to her, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Just what David said, or what Reverend Nathan said to David, the Lord is with you. And then he comes back and says, oh, actually, he's not. <laughs> and the angel says to Mary, the Lord is with you. And whereas David sort of put, you know, let me be the one, I'll build him a house, it's going to be fantastic. Mary is not pushing herself forward at all. The angel comes to her and it's totally unexpected. And she says, be it done unto me according to thy word. Whatever God wants, I will do. It's not me coming up with the ideas. The Lord decides himself. And again, he says uh, to Nathan, I will be a father to him and he a son to me. And you will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. And when they hear that, anybody hearing that uh, immediately says, ah, yes, these are the Davidic promises. Um, so uh, I think it's good to, to, to hear uh, the passage and, and to see the, the references that Luke is making. And King David came and sat before the Lord and said, who am I, Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? So David goes into the tabernacle and, and sits before the ark. And um, St. Augustine wrote a whole passage on this, a question, you know, a 
about posture in prayer. Um, and he says, actually, there are lots of different postures in prayer. And this is one of the examples he gives. David sits before the ark. And you get the sense of him kind of listening to Nathan and thinking, wow, um, this is pretty special. Um, not just am I a king, but I'm promised that my descendants will reign forever. And the Lord will build a house for me and rescue me from all my enemies. And, and it, it's kind of overwhelming. And he goes, and we see a side of David here that perhaps isn't always apparent, you know, when he's the swashbuckling hero of the battles and, you know, um, uh, capturing his enemies' wives and, uh, 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 you know, the exuberant dancing David. And here is the quiet and contemplative David. Who am I? Lord God. And what is my house? Would you have brought me thus far? And even this is too little in your eyes, Lord God. For you have also spoken of your servant's house in distant time. And this is a man's instruction, Lord God. And how can David speak more to you? When you know your servant, Lord God, for the sake of your word and according to your heart, you have done all these great things to make known to your servant. Remember, David's chosen because he is a man after God's own heart. And here he talks uh, about God's heart. It's an, 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 an analogy, of course, but in the revelation, um, that we're given of the sacred heart of Jesus. We see already in the Old Testament this idea of God's heart full of love. Therefore you are, are you great, Lord God, for there is none like you, and there is no God beside you in all we have heard with our own ears. And this is the idea of the book of Deuteronomy, isn't it? You know, um, what nation is there that has its God so close to it as our God is to us? And there is none like you. Um, and, and David, who has already defended the honour of the Lord, um, when he speaks that magnificent speech to Goliath, and he says, uh, now, there is none like you. And who is like your people Israel? A unique nation upon earth whom a God has gone out to redeem as a people, to make him a name and to do great and awesome things for them, to drive out from before your people whom you redeemed from Egypt, nations with their gods. Again, not just the greatness of God, but him choosing this people, this unique people, to be his people. It, it's, it's a love story that David's speaking of. And you made your own people Israel unshaken forever, and you, O Lord, became their God. And now, Lord God, the word that you have spoken to your servant concerning his house, make it stand forever and do as you have spoken. And may your name be great forever, so it be said, the Lord of armies is God over Israel, and the house of David your servant shall be unshaken before you. For you, O Lord of armies, God of Israel, have revealed to your servant, saying, A house where I build you. Therefore has your servant found the heart to pray to you this prayer. And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words must be true. You have spoken of this bounty to your servant, and now have the goodness to bless the house of your servant to be before you forever. For it is you, Lord God, who have spoken. And with your blessings, may your servant's house be blessed forever. So this, this, David isn't always, you know, speaking these grand speeches. Sometimes he's talking about very straightforward, mundane things. But here, he, his words reach far into the future. May your house be blessed forever. And after chapter 7, we turn back to uh, those mundane matters and we get a bit of fighting in here. So it really was a brief interlude then. And it happened thereafter, 
uh, when is there after? Well, who knows? Again, it, 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 it's thematic rather than chronological. That David struck down the Philistines and subjugated them. And David took Mehed Anna from the hand of the Philistines. And he struck down Moab and measured them out with a line, making them lie on the ground. And he measured two lengths of a line to put to death and one full length to keep alive. So um, Moab, remember David went and took refuge with the king of Moab when he was fleeing from Saul. Well, now he's striking them down. And this has to be said rather gruesome practice of um, killing two-thirds of them and keeping one-third alive. And Moab became tribute-bearing vassals to David. And David stuck, struck down had at Nisa, son of Rehob, king of Zophar, as he went to restore his monument by the Euphrates River. So presumably, uh, um, King Hadadiza is, is you know, busy uh, with his uh, kind of architectural projects by the Euphrates River, and David uses the chance to come and strike him down. And David captured from him 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers. And David hamstrung all the chariot horses, leaving aside a hundred of them. Uh, so again, rather gruesome, uh, hamstrung, hamstringing all these horses. The Israelites at this stage don't really use horses, and so maybe a hundred of them are kept for show, but um, they don't use them in battle themselves. And the Arameans of Damascus came to aid Hadadiza, king of Zobab, and David struck down 22,000 men from among the Arameans. And David set up prefects in Aram Damascus, and the Arameans became tribute-bearing vassals to David, and David, the Lord made David victorious wherever he went. And David took the golden quivers that had belonged to the servants of Hadadiza and brought them to Jerusalem, and from Bitter and Berathai and the towns of Hadadiza, King David took a great abundance of bronze. And you might think, well, after all the edification that we just had, now David is just a great tribal thug going out and, um, you know, um, throwing his weight around, killing people, hamstringing their horses, taking the booty. And as I said about chapter 7, I think we're right if we're concerned about those things. Um, but the scriptures are reporting facts, they're not necessarily endorsing them. Uh, even though it says the Lord helped David in battle, the point is that David established his, his dominion, and it is just this tiny corner of the Middle East, um, and it's a sign and an emblem and a prophecy of the eternal dominion of Christ. And final chapter we'll look at today, we see a slightly more tender side of David. And David said, is there anyone who is still alive, who is still left from the house of Saul, that I may keep faith with him for the sake of Jonathan? So again, this is sometime later, and David, he has a sort of pain of conscience, he thinks, Gosh, I have rather, you know, conquered everything that Saul has. Uh, I wonder if there's anyone left, especially remember those promises that he and Jonathan made to each other when David said, you'll be the king and I will serve you. And now David is the king and thinks, I wonder if there's anyone left of the house of Saul, especially if he's connected with Jonathan, because I, I can keep faith in that way. And there was a servant of the house of Saul named Ziba. Remember that name, because uh, in about ten chapters' time, we're going to meet Ziba again. And hmm, I think he's a bit, yeah, ambitious for himself and double dealing. But we don't know this yet. And they called him to David, and the king said to him, "Are you Ziba?" And he said, "Your servant." And the king said, Is there anyone at all left from the house of Saul that I might keep God's faith with him? 
And Ziba said to the king, there is a son of Jonathan's who is crippled. He says that right away um, because he doesn't yet know why is the king asking suddenly after, are there any descendants of Saul around? Uh, I just want to be really nice to them. <laughs> well, most kings uh, would be wanting to wipe them out. And actually, though David is going to be really nice here, later on he does um, put to death uh, a number of Saul's descendants in order to appease the Gibeonites, uh, and it's rather brutal. Um, so you know, he's perfectly prepared to be ruthless in wiping out opposition when he needs to be. And so Ziba says, he's crippled. He's not a rival. He's not a threat to you. Don't worry. And the king said, where is he? And Ziba said, why? He is in the house of Machir, son of Amiel, from Lodabar. And King David sent and fetched him from the house of Machir, son of Amiel, from Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and flung himself on his face and prostrated himself. So Mephibosheth, uh, we've met him before when he was a tiny little toddler. We know why he's lame. It's because um, after the defeat at Gilboa, everyone was terrified and fleeing and the nurse dropped him on the way. And so he's been crippled ever since. And he arrives and he flings himself to the ground. And while that may have been a standard piece of protocol, we didn't hear Ziba doing it. Um, so it's clearly important that he did do it. And just think, somebody who's crippled in both legs to fling himself to the ground is quite an operation. Um, he's clearly wanting to show maximum subservience in order to preserve his life. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he said, your servant here? And David said to him, fear not, for I will surely keep faith with you for the sake of Jonathan, your father. And I will give back to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather. And as for you, you shall eat bread at my table always. And he prostrated himself again, presumably, and said, what is your servant? that you should have turned to a dead dog like me. The last time we heard about a dead dog, it was David, uh, when Saul was out hunting him to him, and he, he says, you know, why all this for catching a flea on the back of a dead dog? <laughs> uh, and now the tables are turned. Who's the dead dog now? Saul's grandson. And the king called to Ziba, Saul's lad, and said to him, all that was Saul's and his whole household's I give to your master's son, and you shall work the soil for him, you and your sons and your slaves, and you shall bring food to your master's house, and they will eat. But Mephibosheth will always eat bread at my table. That's clearly a kindness. He's saying, all right, I'm going to look after you from now on. But is there another motivation? The potential saul eyed heir is going to be kept in luxurious housing um, arrest. He's going to keep his enemy close, just in case he is an enemy. And you stay with me and you meet at my table and that, that way I'll know where you are and it will all be very nice. But there's a, there's a note of steel under the soft exterior. And Ziba had 15 sons and 20 slaves. And Ziba said to the king, whatever my lord, the king commands his servant, thus will his servant do. I wonder why we get that detail. I think it's because later on we're going to discover that Ziba's quite anxious to get as much money and, and possessions and land as he can get his hands on. Maybe with his 15 sons to look after, that's why. And Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a little son named Micah. And all who dwelled in Ziba's house were servants to Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth, it's very difficult to say, dwelled in Jerusalem, for at the king's table he would always eat. And he was lame in both his feet. 
strange again that that's mentioned again, it's like emphasizing, and he's really no danger. Um, uh, and um, you know, the, the house of Saul uh, is, is really pretty much finished off. I think I need to stop there. Um, next week, we will hear um, a little bit of David still being um, kind of ferocious and winning battles and, and so on. And then we will get to chapter 11. And chapter 11 is the turning point in the whole story of David. It's when he looks over the wall of the palace roof and he sees Bathsheba. So next week will be very exciting. Any questions? I pray thee, loving Jesus, that as thou hast graciously given me to drink in with delight the words of thy knowledge, so thou wouldst mercifully grant me to attain one day to thee, the fountain of all wisdom, and to appear forever before thy face. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.